the uh, my next door neighbor is actually going to get on the plane uh, Wednesday morning, and uh, she's looking forward to uh, to seeing the snow. Believe it or not, yeah. I think one time in the, when she was a kid, she saw snow. Of course, we're we're talking about when the family house in Puerto Rico, and a lot of people have not seen snow down here. So she uh, next door neighbor is going to leave on Wednesday. So perfect timing. She's going to see snow over there. I tell you, snow is no good. I I went out. I came. My shoes were wet. I came back. I had to go out and and buy something because my uh you know this is getting more in depth to my life, to my life. My uh, toilet got clogged. I had to go back out and and get some Drano. And as I was going out, since my shoes were wet, I slipped, fell right in my backside. So if that oh, ouch, if ouch. That's what she's looking forward to. That's what she's gonna find. Because snow is not fun. It's just gonna be wet, slippery, and icy. And you're just gonna fall and either uh, bang your knees up, or 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 hit the back of your rear end and and probably spill it and probably split it. I remember uh, when I was uh, young, uh, I used to uh, be a, uh, well, I used to deliver. I used to work for courier service, and uh, boy, we were out there all winter long, out on the streets all day long, and boy, that was uh, that was kind of rough, I tell you, especially when the temperature dropped and all the snow turns into ice. That's when you really are, are taking a chance and risk you know, for falling on your ass. Oh. Hopefully, you don't you don't break anything. Well, yeah, <laughs> the worst thing you could do when you fall on your rear end is is you're gonna split it. <laughs> so this girl, uh, she told me she went uh, as a kid to Chicago when it was snowing. So, but she hasn't seen it since. So I think it's going to bring back some memories, and she's going to go, "Why did I come here in the first place, anyways?" <laughs> like she's going to fall down and and uh, her rear end. <laughs> okay, considering the weather was really nasty the other weekend, you went to see Deadpool. I mean, was the theater crowded? Did the audience show up? It's funny. I went to see it. Um, it was during, I think it, it was, um, what it would call the crowd. I, I went to see it on, um, let me see, Saturday morning. And they, they said, I went to the one on 34th AMC. It, it, it said it was going to start at 10. I got there like nine 30, bought my ticket, ran up, I found a seat that was, you know, the, it was kind of empty. There weren't too many people in there. And then you know, because it's 9.30, I usually expect people to be there earlier, right? You buy your ticket, you're, you're there sitting an hour and waiting until the movie starts. But by the time 10 o'clock rolled around, it seemed like a, a tsunami of people ran into the theater. Out of no Really? Yeah, out of nowhere. And then all, these, all of a sudden, these people are trying to look for seats, trying to sit with strangers. I'm like, get here earlier. If you see it's going to start at 10, it doesn't mean show up exactly at 10. <laughs> These are, uh, these are uh, yeah, these are the same people who, who, who show up and then they complain. Oh man, I was sitting in the front row. Well, that's what happens when you show up at the last yeah. minute. And the worst thing is, like some of these people bring like twenty people with them, and they want to sit all together and hold each other's hand and touch each other's knees while they're watching Deadpool. <laughs> right? They want to get real intimate. Oh man, I, I really want to see this with twenty people. Take the whole roll of uh, what do you call it? a whole roll over. And and while I'm watching, it, get really excited and start touching the person's knee next to me. Yeah, <laughs> like, that, that is that and that and that is a typical New York crowd, yep. I guess. Yep, like like they would say in uh, Puerto Rico, a, a typical he bottle thing to do. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, they're a little bit more reserved here. When we went to see uh, uh, Star Wars over here, uh, the crowd really got into it. They, uh, you know, they left all the right parts. They cheered, you know, when they saw the Millennium Falcon and stuff like that. But they were pretty much uh, b uh, behaved. I figured they're going to be quiet. Uh, they're just going to be really rowdy because they they know how to get rowdy You're over right. here. A lot of people don't realize. A lot of people don't realize that we have uh, over someone we have a coliseum and a lot of heavy metal bands play there. And I was told uh, it was pretty dangerous for Metallica when they were played in Puerto Rico in San Juan. I mean that 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 only came out and they they were riled up and stuff like that. You know, uh, you know. I mean yeah. that happened with Guns N' Roses in Canada. You know, when a crowd gets riled up, doesn't matter what location. You know, they get riled up. They'll get riled up and stuff like that. You know. Oh, yeah, I heard the same thing when I was over there in Ecuador, and I think they said, uh, I'm trying to figure out, well, did Metallica play played in, in Quito? And and I, I didn't go, of course, because I was on, in, like, well, the heel, but in Quito, I heard when they played, uh, there were people out there waiting to bust in, and they didn't even purchase tickets. There were people who didn't even purchase tickets, couldn't get tickets, and were just massing around the, the stadium and expected to just, like, storm the wall and, 
or storm storm the wall, you know, the, the uh, seize the the stadium and go in there and and hear it for free or something. But you mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, buy your ticket. Don't don't uh, go there and, and and stand outside and expect that they're gonna let you in. Well, I mean, it's, I I remember the uh, back in the good old days, like I was watching that HBO special Vinyl, um, uh, uh, produced and directed by M uh, Michael Scorsese, and uh, they had people like uh, uh, what you call it, uh, Led Zeppelin, you know, actors playing Led Zeppelin and everything like that, and uh, uh, the main character, sorry, record executive, he uh, he's trying to get like a new sound for his record company, and then uh, this is like the start of punk. He goes to a, a punk uh, to see a punk band and stuff like that. Uh, and these guys are so wild up that uh, the stage uh, uh, falls apart. Next thing you know, the whole f the whole building falls apart oh. because everybody's ju everybody's jumping on top of one another and just creating a whole massive scene. So the whole episode ends. The pilot episode, the whole thing ends when the whole building just c collapses. It's like now nah, that's a show. <laughs> and I've been to some, so I've been to some, some crazy shows. Like like I went to see the Who. Everybody knows about the history of the Who, where uh, the on uh, Owen uh, was it? I believe in Cleveland, where the audience was rushing to get a good spot in front of the stage and people got run over i was at madison square garden and luckily the the audience was pretty much uh, uh you know they, they were sitting down i was sitting in second row and luckily the audience was pretty much c calmed down so yeah that, that's what back in the day when they, they call that festival seating festival seating yeah now it's just like open house you know you walk in and uh you know they do that with a lot of uh, the dance uh yeah, they, what was it uh electronic dance bands electronic dance music and stuff like that you know but then uh, it, it it's it's more um how do you say it? it's more controlled people get their wristbands and oh. you know they go in in sections I, I still heard about that happening with one of these acdc concerts in brazil i think three years ago it was still uh, sort of like they give you a wristband but then as close to the musicians as possible. And, and this one uh, Yahoo that I know who, who loves AC and DC and, and, and uh, heavy metal, he, he uh, said that he, he had to use, uh, what do you call it, uh, elbows and, um, and knees just to break through, through the crowd just to get closer to the stage. Wow. Yep. I, I I've seen I've seen uh, ACDC a couple of times. As a matter of fact, the first time I saw ACDC was with uh, with the original singer Bon Scott at the Palladium on 14th Street in New York City. And the funny thing about it was they opened up for this band called UFO. It was a heavy metal band that really didn't break big, and uh, and in the states they were big in, in Europe. And uh, ACDC opened up for them. Clouds was really psyched. They were well behaved. But the funny thing about that show was uh, it was a it was like a theater, a 3,000 seats theater. So ACDC was the first band to come out. They were opening for UFO. They they did this set, uh, and then about an hour set, they uh, they went off the stage and everything, and announced and said, "Okay, UFO is going to be next." And about two thirds of the audience cleared out. They were just there for ACDC, not for oh, UFO. Whoa. Yeah, we were sitting in the back in the audience, like the what was it like uh, the fiftieth row, whatever. Oh. And next thing next thing you know, we were sit and we were sitting about eighth row to see UFO. And um, I swear, like in the middle of the show, we just walked and said, "Want to get drunk? Yeah, my friend Steve, want to get drunk? Yeah, let's get out of here." We walked out of the yeah. show. Okay, we went in eighth row. We said, "The hell with this," because they sucked, and especially after ACDC. And right in the middle of the show, we just walked, and that was the end of that. Back for that group. Yeah, I mean, there, there was a lot of emphasis. Uh, Palladium was a great place. Of course, everybody knows about the Rolling Stones, talking about Martin Scorsese. Um, he did a movie on them, a concert movie. Uh, and then, uh, what was it? Uh, that one I didn't see. I did see Kiss. Now, that was interesting because that particular day to see Kiss in the middle of July, which was steaming as, a, as it was, 90 degrees outside. There was no a uh, AC, no air conditioning inside. And then on top of that, they brought out all the fireworks, uh, the explosions, and the, the, uh, Jimmy Simmons, uh, he did his fire breathing kind of thing. And they actually had fire tubes in the back of the stage, and the fire went up when they did like firehouse and hotter than hell. And it, it went up to like 110 degrees, 120 degrees, right in the middle of July, seeing Kiss in a small 3,000 seat theater. 
Oh uh, man, I don't know how we got how how we made it through that show. Another one that was like that. We so went to see Iron Maiden, uh, on was it the Studio Fifty Four, and that used to be like a disco house, you know, and just one big open floor. It only it could only hold about a thousand people, and we we were sitting on top of radiators, people were sitting on top of cigarette oh. machines, and, and there, there must have been at least almost two thousand people in a thousand seat place. They oversold, and again, no temperature. It was middle of August. <laughs> And they, yeah, and they did a, a two a full two hour show. Uh, that was a, what was it? That tour was the Fear of the Dark tour. I've, obviously, most of you know that I'm a, I'm a big heavy metal fan. That, I lived through the '80s, and I saw a lot of these guys. But so, some of these uh, uh, clubs, man, they uh, I don't know how hey. we, we're talking about this. This girl's going through. He's going to see, uh, visit snow. Man, I don't want to be inside a hot place in August ever again. That that was too much. Play CBGBs is a terrible location. For- all the the up and comers were playing there, but it was like it, you could hardly uh, extend your arms to get into that place. That place is a little hole in the wall. But I don't. For some reason or other, people think that that uh, CBG is a huge place. As a matter of fact, we stood uh, we stood in line. We got in and we just uh, we went to see Joan Jett on I think a fourth album. Um, that, I think that was right after. Um, Live long rock and roll. Uh, put another diamond. In, uh, uh, put another diamond in the jukebox. That song, and she came up with a new uh, a new album. It was the yellow album with all good people or something like that. Um, and that that place was uh, was a steamer. Let me tell you, that was uh, that was also like ninety degrees, no air conditioning, nothing like that. That's the only band that I saw in CBGBs. Considering piece, people ask me, yo, uh, that was in the Bowery. That's where you lived, right? Near where I lived, near Chinatown. A downtown uh, New York City area, and uh, that was the only band we managed to get to see. But it was hard to see those bands. You have to uh, like stand in a long line, and you were lucky if you got in. Usually, you had to line up like in the middle of the afternoon to get into a like a eleven, twelve o'clock midnight show. Crazy, it's sort, of, it's sort of like what the premieres are nowadays. But but I, I heard also too that that um, the Yarboroughs are suing Led Zeppelin because a lot of their music was stolen. Uh, Led Zeppelin. This is what I hear that Led Zeppelin stole a lot of the music from the Yardbirds. Well, uh, uh, believe it or not, they just stole from everybody. If you go to YouTube, <laughs> there's a great video on YouTube, uh, Led Zeppelin ripoffs, and uh, yeah, it, it, they get, it's about like twenty, twenty or thirty songs ripped wow. off. Wow, and I'm surprised they never got sued, and they let them continue. Now they're suing them, but after the fact, they probably blew all the money, and and uh, them suing them now, I, I don't know what took them so long. To, to try to take them to court. They should have done it while they still had money, probably. Well, they, they had good lawyers. The, the, the thing with that was they, they managed, uh, some of them, the, the, I think the most famous one, believe it or not, is Whole Lot of Love. And they got, they got busted for that. They took a riff from uh, Willie Dixon. And, of course, they did songs of Willie Dixon. I believe that on one song in the first album and another song in the second album. Um, my memory holds up. Uh, but uh, for the song "Whole Lot of Love," there was a uh, that the famous uh, that bass riff was with Willie Dixon, and he never got credit. He sued, and he finally got his money. But it took like almost ten years, to, ten fifteen years to finally get that. Uh, other songs, uh, they they just managed to get away with. You know, the uh, some of them were never uh, attested in court. They just yeah yeah. He's ten thousand dollars. Leave us alone. It was you know things that settled out of court. I think the most famous famous one was Stay With a Heaven, which, uh, which I was mentioned about two years ago, and you hear the beginning intro from another band, and, you know, somebody was asking me as a musician, a composer, yeah. uh, do, do you think that was right? And I said, well, you know, you know, the problem with that is, is, is it just an introduction of an uh, of an A minor chord and the bass goes down. Uh, the first person who did it, believe it or not, was George Harrison. While my guitar gently weeps is an A chord, the A goes down to a, a G, an F sharp, F, and an E. Chicago around the same time, 1969, uh, 25 or 64, same exact um, uh, riff progression: A to G to F sharp, F E. So. If you listen to the acoustic part, it's the bass that is going down. The difference between that, without getting sounding too technical, was um, Jimmy went down, but then he did a turnaround, which means if you know your alphabet A G F sharp F E going backwards, he went back up to G A. The other song went down to a D, uh, to a D minor chord, and that changed the whole song around. And 
I, you know, it's kind of a, uh, he kind of copped it a little bit. Yes, he did. Uh, but, uh, by going up, back up to the, to the root, to the air, to the A minor chord, it's a different song altogether. The other guy went to a D minor chord, and that changed the song completely different, in a different direction. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, some people can argue, was it, was he, he actually stole it? Well, he got the idea from the other song, that's obvious, but he didn't pay and he got away with a, it. Yeah, it sounds like the same thing, uh, Vanilla Ice said when, uh, they said that he, he ripped off Under Pressure for Ice Ice Baby. Well, actually, he did. <laughs> he changes it. He changes it, so it's a whole different song. Yeah, that that was a little bit too close to the comfort. As well, as a matter of fact, um, was what was the song, the song recently? Um, oh, a little. What was that song? Lord um, Line. Thank you, Farrah Williams. Yeah, okay, uh, Babun Thick, and I mean. My thing, my uh, thing is, it is chord progression. It is a different song, but every time that song came on, I said, "Wait a second, did somebody die? Wait a second, uh, well, no, Marvin Gaye did die already. So why are they playing this song? The beginning is exactly like the the original record, um, uh, by Marvin Gaye. What was what was the name of the original record? Uh, I I forgot, but I, I know I I know I heard the two of them in comparison. Yeah, and then, I mean that 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 whole rhythm intro is a, is a complete cop out of the original Marvin Gaye, and, you know. And you hear the beginning, it's like that's is that the Marvin Gaye song? I said no. Then the song uh, the song changes, but it was too close for comfort. Then the minute that they got inspired by it in the beginning, well, if you do something like that, add some bells, add a little melody line, or something completely different to cover up that riff. They didn't cover the, up the riff, so they they were actually left naked, you could say. And so they got busted, you know. To any musician or composer out there, if you, everybody gets inspired somehow. Even the Beatles admitted themselves. Well, I got this idea. John Lennon said, oh, I was trying to be Chuck Berry over here. Uh, we were trying to be the Everly Brothers, uh, Paul McCartney said at one time. You know, everybody gets inspired. But and um, going back to movies, Steven Spielberg said, listen, everybody's balls from everybody. Steven Spielberg said, just know how to cover up your yep. shit. That's a quote from Steven Spielberg, and everybody knows that's the most one of the most famous scenes uh, of Indiana Jones at the end when they put the Ark away and in, um, in a, was it the Raiders of the Lost Ark? They put that Ark inside a crate, which gets buried inside a warehouse. That's the final shot. That is the shot that he took from Citizen Kane of World's yep. Bud. Where where is the World's Bud? And you see the giant warehouse at the end. I mean, even he kept that scene. And, you know, the only difference with the original scene was black and white, and his was in uh, Panavision Technicolor. But even Spielberg, uh, um, even David Lean one time, said he wanted him to do Empire of the Sun with a very young 10-year-old Christian Bell with John Malkovich. And David Lean was going to do that movie about World War II, except he got so sick, he asked to Spielberg, can you, um, it's already in pre-production and we got we got to go film. I can't. I'm too ill. Can you take over and direct it for me? I said, I, and I um, you know this is too too soon to notice. I need to time to prep. I said, you've been stealing my work left and right with shadows and everything. Just do the fucking film. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> I like what Spielberg did when I heard that he completely ripped off E.T. from that the movie Mac and Me. Well, it wasn't a movie. It was, it was actually a play, Mac and Me. Yeah. And completely stole everything up to the Reese's Pieces part. Exactly. Well, I, well, believe it or not, uh, the uh, Harrison Ford was um, married to Melissa Matheson. She uh, supposedly wrote the script, but it was uh, from a um, a story that uh, Spielberg had, and she made it into a script. And supposedly, he he got a lot of ideas from a lot of other stuff. I mean, you know, I mean, the, first of all, the concept is a boy and his dog. You know, except that this is a boy and his alien. You know, I mean, it's not too original to begin with. You know. Um, but uh, yeah, that, I mean that, that's oh, uh, here's uh, somebody brought this up to me and it and they mentioned to me because I mentioned um, the, doc, documentaries. Uh, Amy, which got the BAFTA award, about Amy Winehouse talking about music and movies. Um, uh, Marlon Brando. Uh, I am Marlon Brando. I, I forgot the name of it. It was the documentary. What he did was he recorded over 700 hours of personal archives on a, on a tape recorder and uh, this producer director writer he took over the archives and put it together in chronological order and he showed film clips and I mentioned this you know you see uh, uh, Marlon Brando dressed as uh, was it Carl uh, you know Superman's father and you see him holding the script and you see somebody behind the camera holding a cue card and you see an actor hold you know has a, a like a, a, a 
uh, a, a, a postcard, a giant postcard taped to his chest with some of the lines so he can recite them. <laughs> Marlon Brenda had a hard time memorizing this stuff. But anyway, I mentioned that documentary, and somebody said, well, talk about that documentary. He did a movie called Mutiny on the Bounty. Okay, not the Mutiny on the Bounty with Mel Gibson and Anthony Hopkins. That was remade in the 80s. Uh, this was the original Mountain, um The original one was, I believe, with uh, Clark Gable back in the 30s. This was a remake in the 60s, Marlon Brando. And uh, there's a scene when they take um, uh, Trevor Rabin, I believe it's no, Trevor Howard, English actor, who was also with Marlon Brando and the original Superman, uh, Superman 1 with Christopher Reeve. Uh, he was one of the jurors. Um, that's Trevor Howard, English actor. And they, uh, he, Trevor Howard played Captain Bly. And, of course, Marlon Brando played Christian. Um, Captain Christian. Anyway, uh, that version of Mutant and Bounty, uh, the captain, Captain Bly, the mean bastard son of a bitch that he was, he had to prove a point and said, uh, I'm going to flog this guy because he disobeyed orders, but I'm going to take this guy and we're going to tie him up and we're going to drag him underneath the boat. And if he uh, can hold his breath and he goes from, to the, well, from one side to the boat to the other side, he can hold his breath long enough and he lives, I'll, uh, I'll pardon him. I, I'll excuse him. But the whole idea is you have to hold your breath while they tore your ass down underneath the boat. Somebody told me the trivia question there is that there's a theme of Jaws. Dun, 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 when the guy is dragging, being dragged underneath the boat, mutant in the bounty. And, of course, that was the theme that John Williams brought to Steven Spielberg for the, for the theme for Jaws. Oh. Okay, I ran, out of, I ran out of breath. The whole point is people... People cop shit from other places. Steal. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So are you influenced? Uh, um, you were inspired? What was that saying? We talked about it uh, uh, oh, a while back. Uh, um, it, it, stealing imitation it. is the best form of flattery. That's one of them. And the other one, um, bo borrowing a smarter but stealing is genius. What's that line? I don't. I never heard that line. Yeah, at the, the, a lot of famous people, a lot, a lot of producers and directors use that line. You know, uh, borrowing something is smart, but uh, stealing is uh, is genius. For it, you know, <laughs> just like, like, uh, you know, I, I know, like you were telling me before, a lot of people got mad because we said this about Star Wars, but it's basically what the, the latest Force Awaken did. They borrowed a lot of things from the first Star Wars. And just put it on there, and it's almost—it almost seemed like I started seeing a carbon copy at one point. Right, right. Um, oh, getting back to Deadpool, I guess. Well, no, I just, just want to add one thing, and that's what we call beats. It had the same beats, and uh, we don't want to get technical filmmaking one on one on you, but beats is like. You know, okay, uh, chapter one, this happens. Chapter two, that happens. Chapter three, this is going to happen. And I said this, uh, I always compare this to uh, Prometheus, uh, which basically was a remake of Alien, number one. Really, Scott, who directed both pictures. And it's, it's almost the same thing where they, they're on this planet. Uh, the two dummy scientists go into a cave. They said, hey, look at this. So there's a cute little snake. Hey, let, let me play with the snake. And the snake goes on his helmet. It chokes him. And it puts this uh, parasite uh, inside his body. They take the guy. They bring him back to the ship. And, of course, the parasite escapes. Flash forward in the middle of the movie. On the second half of the movie, the girl has the parasite. And all of a sudden, the thing is busting out of her. But she operates on herself. But the whole point is that the parasite is coming out of her almost the same thing like the first movie a lot of the a lot of uh, um, the, the highlights of the first movie was repeated in this one so uh, again you know uh, i know some some people got on our case and other people said the same thing in the comments on indb is like well what are you gonna ruin the party for us man you know but you know look at the film carefully it is basically the same thing come on wasn't that Luke skywalker on on a big gangway and all of a sudden here's harrison ford walking the big gangway you know and he falls off just like luke skywalker fell off no i am your if father it, and luke just jumps it's almost the same if, thing if anything it also reminded me a lot where uh obi-wan kenobi uh faces up to darth vader and obi-wan kenobi doesn't make it and then it sort of makes you hate darth vader even more but in this scene when I, i'm not sure can we by this time if you haven't seen it, it's your fault so we're going to do spoilers at this point, what it was it called? Um, uh, Harrison Ford, Han Solo goes up to uh, uh, the next, the new Darth Vader, uh, right, uh, 
Ren or whatever, I have forgot because now I don't even care. He, oh, you mean, oh, yeah, you mean Kylo, Kylo Ren. Ren? I don't even care about this character. <laughs> he kills Han Solo, drops him off, and everybody was like, oh, crush, no! Meanwhile, I'm thinking to myself, good, man, get rid of that uh, crush, the old bastard. <laughs> now at least we don't have to see him in any more movies unless he starts, he shows up like a ghost. I mean, this guy's a, a crotchety old fart. He was a crotchety old fart even as a young guy, man. He was he was uh, uh, ornery to, from the first to the last uh, Star Wars. I mean, he, he, good riddance. I know a lot of people are going to get mad about that, but it's the truth. I mean, if you have somebody who doesn't want to be at the party and you spend so much money for the party, wouldn't you want to say, hey, if you don't like the party, I spent so much money, I have you here as one of my honored guests, and you're going to throw a hissy fit, you know, get the hell out. I bet you uh-huh. that was their Hollywood's way of saying, oh, yeah, you're going to be pissy about it, then you're not going to be in the rest of the movies. Here you go. We kill you, and you're off. Get out. Well, you know, he was pushing to be killed off in Empire Strikes Back. and said, not so fast. You're going to stick around for the third one. Now, in this one, he well, he, he didn't want to do it. Uh, Star Wars. He wanted to do Indiana Jones. And said, okay, we're going to buy all the franchise. We're going to buy both Star Wars and Indiana Jones. And now, before you do Indiana Jones, you're going to have to do Star Wars. And they said, so you want, uh, tell you, we're going to give you a blessing. You want to get killed? We're going to kill you off. That way you don't show for the rest of the sequels. And then you can go ahead and do your Indiana Jones. In the meantime, we're going to pay a whole shit little, uh, shit little money. Can you finally be uh, happy for once? And that's why he did the movie. He's a, you know? That's what I'm telling you. He's a miserable, contemptuous <laughs> old fart. <laughs> <laughs> he shouldn't even have agreed to say, oh, we're going to do uh, Indiana Jones again. Nobody's interested. Nobody wants to see this guy anymore in Indiana Jones. The last one was horrible. If they do another one, they're going to make it even worse. The only thing they could do is make it even worse than the last one. That's, you know, hell. Uh, uh, put Shia LaBeouf and, 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 and bring in uh, Jar Jar Binks. Right. But... But Jar Jar Binks, no, 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 no. We don't want to go that far. Right, if you're going to go, go all extreme. the way, just go all the Really <laughs> take a dump on it. Take a dump on the audience. Look at us like we're stupid and just do it. I mean, you know, I'm sick of of these people who, who these people who are actors, get they get invited. It's really a lack of professionalism in Hollywood. The I see the English actors are more professional. They go, they do what they're supposed to. They might not like it, but they... They they add a level of professionalism. Like yes, I'm gonna go there. I don't I don't think this is anything sort of like um who who was it was it Ian McKellen uh, Obi Wan Kenobi. So I, from what this I don't, it? I'm not really sure if that was his name. Uh, I may get it wrong, but anyway, I heard he didn't even believe in the project, but it was a job. He needed the money, so he showed up very professional. He didn't he didn't throw a hissy fit. He didn't. Uh, uh, be a real jerk about it. He he took it. He did it seriously, like if it was a Shakespearean uh, part, and he took it. Became professional. And it was great. Nobody had a problem with him. <laughs> Actors, they're all pissy. Like, oh, I don't want to do it. Oh, I don't want to. You know, they're just asking for more money, like mercenaries. Wah 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 wah. Give me more money. Yeah, take it. You're only going to blow it on something stupid anyway. And, and then by the end of your career, you're, you're begging to be thrown in anything. You'll be like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do another movie. Hell, if you want to put Jar Jar Binks, I'll, I'll show up with him too. Yeah, yep. Yeah, just a bunch of babies. But if you want, we could get back to uh, Deadpool. Uh, this. Oh well, yeah, we 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 want we want to end the show on a highlight. Like I said, this is a test bed, but so far I think this is going to be a pretty good uh, pilot, shall we say? I think we're going to go ahead with this and put it as a pilot. So we're going to end uh, with the main topic of the of the show, which is going to be a Deadpool. I have I haven't seen it because Valentine's got in the way. Um, usually I, I get together with some people over here, but everybody said, "Oh, we're going to be busy with uh, with our boyfriend girlfriends," and so there was no party. So hopefully this week I'll catch up before I do my live show on Block Talk Radio. Uh, so I haven't seen it yet i'm gonna i'm gonna catch up to it um but uh what was it um one of the ma- um online magazines i'm gonna bring this up real quick and they mentioned a couple of things uh which i'm, I'm gonna reference to uh one of them says the uh the nine best x-men references uh yeah there was references to x-men uh, about nine of them i'm gonna reference that uh while uh, mark gives his review 
And there's another article, the five funniest Deadpool jokes that didn't make it into movies. So I got those articles to mention. But in the meantime, let's start off with Mark's review. The first thing I got to say is um, I put up um, on our blog. We have a blog, okay, Video Land Express blog. Uh, just Google Video Land Express. You'll see our website. You'll see our, our Google site. You'll see our blog site. You'll see uh, a bunch of other things. But anyway, um, on our blog site, uh, every day I put a bunch of articles that we're going to talk about. And I, I put these articles up, and uh, the big article was Variety that nobody saw this coming. It made over $135 million for the weekend, and nobody saw that. Uh, it, the studios themselves didn't even see it coming. They would say, well, hopefully, uh, we'll break even for the $50 million we spend on it. Hopefully, we, maybe we can make 70 75 We were lucky. It made 135 Even the studio itself didn't see that coming. It took a big, it took everybody a big surprise. So here it is. I'm going to ask Mark, did the movie deserve to make that much money and did it deserve all the cool oh, that it got? Oh, hell yeah. I, I, that and much okay. more. This, like, I have to say, this is a movie that took Ryan Reynolds pushing this movie to have this party thrown 11 years in the making. It took him 11 years. I went to, to I went to the Ryan Reynolds premiere you know, I was close to getting to uh, see the film, but at the last minute, I was uh, shunned away from from going inside to see the premiere because I I just didn't qualify to get in. But aside from that, I went and watched Ryan Reynolds talk about it, and he was great. He was animated how it took him eleven years to do it and to do it right, because all of a sudden it's like they decided, hey, we're going to give you this project, this uh, DOA. Nobody else wants it. No one believes in it. But you pushed for this for 11 years, and we believe in you, so we're giving you this film. And he definitely did it. Uh, this, if anything, gives you a good idea that superhero films should be R-rated. They're the thing. This movie actually saved superhero films because people were getting tired. They're saying, uh-oh, oh, superhero overload. The same thing, the same thing over, over, over again. But this thing, it completely goes off tangent and it saves superhero films it it gives you more realism it gives you it, it's sort of like watching the mask in a superhero film you know oh okay and the great thing is like he talks he breaks the fourth wall and that's what jim carrey does this is what deadpool's whole gimmick is where he goes in and says and tells you the, the what's going on and the behind the scenes of of um you know why why something is the the way it is so it's great you know it's i laughed at parts before the rest of the audience laughed because i sort of understood what was going to go on so i laughed ahead of time i was one of the few people who was laughing ahead of time before the the because you know he did the setup right the set the punchline right. was going to come. So I laughed while he was doing the setup because I got the punchline before it came out. And people around me, they were like, they didn't get it. They were like, look at me weird. And then boom, when the punchline came, everybody started laughing. Ah, okay. So this was, this was brilliantly written. It was like, like when Jim Carrey first did The Mask and they had some brilliant comedy fourth wall breaks in the mask, this was as good. And you had it was the R-rated. People love R-rated comedy. I don't know why people say, "Oh, you can't have an R-rated uh, comedy or you can't have an R-rated superhero film." Yes, you can. Uh, I think Jim Carrey's The Mask was R-rated, was it, or was it not? Oh uh, no, I think it was PG-13. Yeah, well, it was getting close to R. I bet you they cut off a cut. They they probably just limited the curse words. But, you know, they had so much violence in it, too. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. But this thing definitely saved superhero films. And somebody should write an article how Deadpool, Ryan Reynolds, saved superhero films. Because now people are able to see, oh, this has a dark side. This has a realism to it. There are consequences. It's not like going to be like, oh, I punch you. You get hit so hard. It's not like the last uh, Avengers. Only one person dies or a few people die. But here you you actually see the consequences of shooting each other. The people will die. That was uh, one one film I just like to mention because I I didn't know if this was going to take off 
because of Rated R and everything like that, because everybody's so Disney-fied, you know, the Avengers and everything like that. One of my favorite films was uh, Kick-Ass, and I paid a hit at, oh, man, it's too violent, that's not what superheroes are, I said, you know, get a life, you know, Kick-Ass show you, you get yeah. fucking hurt. <laughs> Big time, okay? And and there's consequences to pay. The movie starts off with some guy jumping off the building, and the guy's narrating, well, you know, I started the day so-so, and here we go off the building. By the way, that's not me. That's some crazy guy who thought he could fly, and the guy crashes right through the car. So that's the beginning. And so the movie tells you right there, we're going right it off for the next for the next hour and a half, uh, kiddies, okay? Uh, so here's the first five minutes. We just went off. So hang in there, boys and girls. This is the direction we're going in. And I, personally, I love one and two. And everybody said, nah, man, that movie's too dark. It's too nasty. That's not the way superheroes is like, oh, you want it to be, um, you know, like me personally, I, I hate the, the Spider-Man thing. Oh, you know, um, uh, great power counts, great responsibility. I said, are you kidding me? Uh, I mean, that, that's a, that is so friggin' annoying. It's like, you know, get, first of all, get alive, g- cut the bullshit out. I mean, a great responsibility. Just go save a kitty and get on with your right. life. You know what I'm saying? You know, and um, uh, what you call it? Um, and and the other, the, what was the other thing? I forgot. I was gonna mention the uh, the other thing. Uh. Oh, the other one was Super, uh, with the guy from uh, the, from the office, Liam Wilson with uh, Ellen Page, and that was kind of brutal. He's a guy he, he wants to be a superhero, and there was nothing but violence. And Kevin Bacon playing the villain, and people were people were getting hurt in that shit. It's real. <laughs> like if you really wanted to become a superhero, there would be consequences. Like you would have to definitely truly hide your identity because people would come after you. Not only. Uh, bad guys but even people in authority would come after you because for some reason they don't like uh vigilantes or people who take the law into their hands because they don't want to do anything about it but they just don't want you to do anything about it you know it's like they want you to have your hands tied it's like oh if they're a criminal organization like you know like all these criminal organizations right now they're all over the world in the city they don't want to do anything about it they want to waste their time beating up on on you know the the common man who pays his taxes but the criminal underworld people no 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 we're not gonna mess with them even though they do a lot worse we rather just go after you for parking violations (laughs) (laughs) well that that that, that's like that other show gotham gotham okay it is a variation of the the batman theme but at least you know people get killed there you know, and it, and it's pretty violent for a TV show. Yeah, it's 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 what they should really do, and and that was the great thing about Deadpool. Deadpool came out, and you know he has a healing factor. I'm not sure if this is a spoiler for anybody, but if you're a Deadpool fan, you you should know this already. So you know, you know a lot of the comic book. It was it was so funny. They said that they only were able to um, what is it? Fox only gave him fifty eight million dollars to make this movie. You know. They use some of the mm-hmm. CGI, uh, CGI and all this stuff, you know. But then I, I was looking at the film and it's like, no, it, it seems very bare bones. It seems very realistic. I'm glad they didn't do go too Hollywood in, in it. But if anything, maybe it was less than 58 million. I mean, if you really see it, maybe the CGI was probably cheaper because they probably outsourced it out to one of these Asian countries, and all the scenes were like um, very, very few sets. You know, they did a lot of flashbacks of very few sets, you know, set one, like, let's say set one highway, set two, this place, set three, someone's house, set four, my house, set five, someone's bar. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and that and that's why the budget was only fifty million dollars. Then you then you had to cut but, corners. But that's the thing. If you say it's fifty eight, I, I believe it's sort of like a construction project. I believe that the real amount that it costs, they probably padded it and put down it's four times as as ex, more expensive than that than it really costs. You know, because they always say, um, like uh, Robert Rodriguez said, he once asked Kevin Bacon. I mean, no, Kevin Bacon, um, Kevin Smith, how much he spent on clerks. And and Kevin Smith, oh yeah, I spent like three six million dollars, and Richard Rodriguez on this show called, um, let me see, uh, spoilers said to him, what you spend that much? I spent less money on on the first El Mariachi. Where the hell did you spend three to six million dollars on on uh, what do you call that? On more rats. And and uh-huh. all you know, these guys, they they like their uh, narcotics or whatever. 
and they, they must have spent it on probably uh, additions to their homes. <laughs> that that was like the famous uh, movie back in the uh, in the seventies. There was a film. Uh, anybody's a James Bond film, uh, James Bond fan. Uh, the 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 movie that um, the studio that used to release uh, the films and back in the beginning was uh, United Artists. And then, uh, of course, United Artists got taken over by MGM. What happened was United Artists, the last film they produced uh, in the 70s was called Heaven's Gate, a movie that started off maybe for about $10 million. Next thing you know, it went up to $40 million. How do how you explain that in today's kind of uh, money situation? Very simple. Just add a zero. A film that cost $100 million ballooned to, a hundred, uh, to about $400 million and it bankrupt the studio. That's when MGM took over and said, uh, the only reason we're taking over is because you own James Bond, so we're going to bail you out and we're going to own you and uh, uh, and the Bond film. So it became uh, United Artists slash MGM. And what happened with Heaven's Gate? They said, uh, why did it balloon so much? Because they, they were out of the middle of country land in the boondocks of Wyoming somewhere and uh, they, they blame it on getting this train over there. That he wanted to use real train, build real tracks and build a little sh- uh, shanty town, whatever. The truth was, it went everybody's uh, noses. Uh, they, they had cocaine guys going, uh, going back and forth. Supposedly, allegedly, that that's the rumor. I don't know. They wrote a book and they said they answered, "Oh no, it was uh, the movie was, uh, was mishandled business wise." But the big rumor was there was a lot of cocaine going back and forth, and that's and they had to cover that up and blame it on the uh, movie production, and that put a studio out of business. So that that's that's a little uh, a tell from the seventies. Uh, does it happen nowadays? Well, you know, people just say, "Why are these movies costing two hundred million dollars?" The point is. Regardless, um, you know where the money is going. I would say, a back of Michael Bay, you see every penny up there. Okay, whether you like Transformers or not. But then the other movies, you see, you spend 200, 200 million dollars. Whether you you spend all that money up there, the picture still sucks. And that's the problem with all these damn big budgets. First, my my thing is that the budgets are way overboard. And number two, um. What you call it? The story sucks, and the movies are too long. Learn how, they got to back, go back to film school and edit the movies. Why are all these movies two and a half hours? You can't tell a movie in two I guess hours. Not. Okay. I guess it like somebody who just uh, starts rambling and doesn't stop rambling because he said, "I'm not going to stop rambling till uh, something comes out of this." Oh, like I just did. <laughs> writers, I, like they'll they'll say, "Oh, some people have writer's block," and others will just start. Uh, rambling like in, in their writings and they'll say wow you, you wrote more than like 500 pages yeah because you know the problem is there's nothing going on in the script so I'm going to keep writing a lot until something comes out of this Well, what was the other thing uh, you, you mentioned before I wanted to add uh, to that oh um, and uh, because I, it's funny you mentioned that uh, Ryan Reynolds saved superhero a lot of people don't know this me and Mark here, we don't talk beforehand when we do the show. You know, I say, "Yeah, hey, want to do a show tonight? Let's hook. Uh, let's try this thing out." By the way, did you say uh, Deadpool? He said, "Yes, okay, let's save it for the show." We always do that. So, when uh, by coincidence, when he said um, Ryan Reynolds uh, saved the superhero genre, I wrote a my thing because I'm um, I really like Ryan, Ryan Reynolds on the Green Lantern. He was the only good thing about it. I said the same thing about Brendan Roge when he played Superman Returns. Uh, it, it wasn't the actor's fault. The movie sucked. One of the worst superheroes of all time. Brendan Roge was actually good. I rated the movie 1 to 5. I gave it a 1 only because of Brendan Roge acting. He was a good Superman. It wasn't his fault. Same thing with Ryan Reynolds. And that torpedoed his career for almost 10 years. So when I saw this, because he was sticking with that Deadpool for the longest. And the people said, you're not going to do it. It's not going to make it. Nobody's going to want to see it. He stuck his guns out. Many because nobody else wanted to hire him for anything else. So he stuck his guns out. And Ryan Reynolds, now what I like about it, especially when an, an actor gets beaten down, they, they, they screwed him up. He made Green Lantern, the movie tank, they k- killed his career, okay? And, you know, every, everything was pointed at Ryan Reynolds who had nothing to do with it. It was a, a badly directed, written movie, etc. And But Ryan Reynolds took the fall. He brought back Deadpool, and now he has final laugh. So I'm glad for him in that respect that he finally, ha-ha, $135 million. Right. Yeah, the last I heard it was 150 Oh, 150 
Uh, oh wow, <laughs> that's pretty good. Oh, because it made 135 uh, million from Friday to Saturday to Sunday. Now they're including uh, today's holiday, so that's 150. Oh, uh, so what do you think? I, um, there's a lot of um, um, but after I put my blog, other articles started coming up, and now some uh, the rumor is. Well, there was already rumored that Warner Brothers was really worried about Batman and Superman. First of all, putting an Easter weekend did not help. If they, they really believed in the movie, they would put it on 4th of July. Remember Superman, the, tr the truth, the American way, and it, you dump it on Easter Bunny weekend? And now the rumor, that because this movie did so good, now they're very worried about how people are going to react to Batman and Superman. Superman sucked the last movie, Man of Steel. Batman, how many times are we going to see this? Uh, and then, of course, they're going to they're going to shove a bunch of yeah, other guys in the movie. That's why I had to combine them, because uh, we were pretty much, since the last Superman movie, we everybody sort of uh, were tapping out on Superman. And even I was thinking, yeah, the only thing that's going to revive Superman as a hero, superhero film is bringing him back down to Earth. And that would only have been uh, putting in Batman into the movie, and that would have to save the Superman franchise. And and I think this movie would actually do pretty well. I, I hope it does. Like Ryan Reynolds said uh, in, in the premiere, he said, I think this movie is going to do better than Star Wars. <laughs> Some people groaned because he, oh, why, why? Is it too early to uh, put down Star Wars? <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah, so. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at this article. Uh, nine best X-Men references. You really got to be an X-Men uh, a fan. But some of this, I think, is just they're oh. just shooting shit here. But uh, um, did anybody recognize any um, uh, anything to X-Men? I, I know there's a reference to Wolverine. He cuts his, uh, Wolverine's face out of a magazine uh, No, no, or he cuts uh, Hugh Jackman's face out of a magazine and puts it over his face. I hope I'm not doing too many spoilers, but, hey, I'm sorry. Spoiler. Yeah, he uh, actually oh, okay. cuts um, uh, Hugh Jackman's face out of magazine. He he grabs a whole bunch. The funniest thing, he grabs a whole bunch of guns for one of the final scenes and throws in uh, the Hugh Jackman uh, People's uh, magazine, uh, which says uh, Hugh Jackman, the sexiest man on alive. And everyone starts to laugh because you know they they're thinking, oh, this is a Wolverine reference. And then, and then when he oh, finally okay. does a reveal. He has uh, he has Hugh Jackman's face stapled to his face. Oh, okay. But I. But the, it, it, uh, also, the, the, is there a mention to the, uh, to the yes, X Men? Yes, yes. I I don't want to give too many spoilers, but he he does hysterical uh, breaking the fourth wall moment when he goes to the X Men mansion. You know, he all the time when they go to him and ask him to join the X Men, they only send Colossus and this other lady who's an X Men. I don't really know her that well. The only person I remember is Colossus because then all of a sudden, after the X Men started adding so many things during the 80s, 90s, I just tapped out and stopped looking at these comic books. And it could expensive. They said they wanted like a dollar, two dollars, three. I'm like, forget you guys. Yeah. <laughs> and then not see it. And uh, so then he he uh, does a funny reference about the X-Men. He um, says, oh, I don't want to be an X-Men. I mean, uh, you know, uh, team up with some perv, some old perv who tells you, uh, tell you, tell you what to do, like some kind of boy band. And then he goes and then eventually he needs their help. He goes to the mansion. He rings the doorbell. Uh, one of the, the, the girl, the female X-Men, you know, the one on the... Um, in, in the uh, commercial, she opens the door, and he goes, Hey, what are you doing? What's going on? Hey, I was going to ask you and the big guy, you know, Colossus, if you guys could come out and help me. And then, you know, he, they go back and forth, and, and you don't see Colossus. He's, he's, you hear his voice in the background uh, talking over the, the girl who opened the front door. And then as, as before he leaves, he goes, You know what's funny? It's funny that, that how come it, I come to the X-Men mansion, I only really see... I only see both of you here. It sort of seems like someone in, in, uh, could, didn't have enough money to buy more than two X-Men. <laughs> so, okay, so there is a, 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 a couple oh, yeah, X-Men references yeah, in the yeah, movie. He, he basically shouts out the fact that they didn't have enough money in the budget to you know, pay for more than two X-Men. 
<laughs> That's funny. So the movie has a good sense oh, of humor. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, ba- by it basically has a funny humor about itself. And it, it basically is sort of letting you know that, oh, you know, the, we, our budget isn't that big. But, you know, we're going to try the best we can. Okay, um, we're, we're heading to the witching hour. We actually got an hour over here. Um, okay, just um, we're going to end in a, another five minutes on a quick note over here. Um, so, your final opinion on Deadpool, and do you recommend it to see? Oh, uh, definitely the audience I recommend it. Oh, and, and when I went to the theater, it was funny. I saw this guy. Uh, I, I guess I don't know who, who, what kind of guy, what kind of father this guy is, but he brought all his kids on the 13th. And he had like a few kids with him, and he brought them all into to an R-rated film. And I'm like, okay, oh, that's some good parenting. Yeah, that's why uh, when these kids grow up, uh, we're not gonna have a problem with them when they grow up. <laughs> Hopefully, it won't be like the Will yeah, Smith exactly. clan. Like, he's bringing these kids under the thirteen. Like one of them looks like ten, the other one looks like five, another one looks like he's only uh, uh, nine. And and Deadpool has a lot of uh, love scenes, nudity, uh, Ryan Reynolds nudity, foul language, murder, uh, killing, cutting. I'm telling you, uh, what kind of, what kind of parents are, are, is this guy? I, I can't even believe I did with this many kids. <laughs> and Ryan Reynolds, when he was at the premiere, I, I put it up on my Facebook account where, where there's a clip of Ryan Reynolds who said. Uh, where, where they have this uh, young kid, like five years old, he's gonna go. His parents are gonna take him to the premiere, and and Ryan Reynolds looks down and says, "How old are you? What are you, five years old? Oh yeah, you're gonna really love this film." <laughs> so so he, uh, uh, Ryan Reynolds was there at the theater uh, when you I were there. I went to the premiere. I went to. He had a premiere on Thursday. I went to that one, and I didn't get to see the film. I only got to see him at the premiere. You know, speaking about the film and all that, and I. I recorded, I took some pictures of him, I put it up on my FB account, and then I, you know, they, they cut me off before I was able to get in to see it because, you know, there was only a, a limited amount of, of regular people who they wanted in. It was, a, it was a premiere, so they wanted to actually get the Hollywood people in, the press in, the Ryan Reynolds, the cast, and a limited amount of people who um, are, are like the fans. And then after that, uh, the following, I think, uh, on Saturday morning, I went to see it. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, you definitely got me. Uh, got to send me some of those Facebook pictures, and that way I can uh, put it on a blog, so I can show you, uh, show the, the you know the fans of the show and stuff like that. Uh, you went to the premiere and you met Ryan Reynolds. That's so cool. He is. Yeah, tall, I saw though, him because right? I was in the back. I didn't. I didn't get to touch his hand, but a whole bunch of other people took a photo with him. They dressed up like Deadpool. Was considered the Deadpool pageant. They all dressed up like this, different versions of Deadpool. They a lot of people got to touch his hand, uh, you know, hug him, take photos with him. He did a selfie with a whole bunch of the audience members. You know, like in the you know before the movie started. You know, outside like a little premiere thing in in AMC on Forty Second Street. But the funny thing is. You know, uh-huh. I think a lot of these people just are a bunch of people just jumped on the bandwagon later. It's like I didn't even know there were this many Ryan Reynolds fans. That that's so cool. That I'm so I'm so glad for him because I heard that he's a, a very nice guy and he's is very uh, very cool to work with. And you know, he really got screwed out of well, Green Lantern. <laughs> You know, so I'm glad he he did a comeback. But I just love the idea he has final laugh on a project that nobody wanted. They said he was not going to make it. And they said, you know, this is going to be the final nail in your coffin. And now he's, right. got, he's got final laugh. I love hearing but, a stories like that. It's fantastic. Uh, Green Lantern was the right movie for him. But if they come up with Green Lantern, they're basically got to do, they, in which I think they will, but then they're going to have to do a change to the Green Lantern character. I don't think it's going to be no longer, you know, a, a white male. It'll probably have to be sort of like the Green Lantern that you see in the Justice League now, you know, uh, uh, an African American. Right, right. They, they, uh, they had what? They had a couple of different Green Lanterns, right? right. They, well, they did the same thing with Spider Man. Spider Man, the, the, the Spider Man kid is a Latino, no, no. whatever. He's a Puerto Rican. They made uh, Spider Man a Dominican, but uh, if. They- they want to reboot Spider-Man. Oh, okay. 
uh, go into just changing Spider-Man into making him a woman and just, you know, forget about the male version of Spider-Man and just because they, they have second uh, Earth or whatever uh, Spider-Man and second Earth uh, Spider-Man is actually a, a female uh, Gwen Stacy. And they should just go like that, uh-huh. you know, like just revamp it because the way they have Spider-Man now, it's like they keep retelling the same story over and over again and they tell it horribly because they keep trying to add their own nuances and it's just awful. So if you're going to add your new your own nuances, just develop the character while it's still young. Take the Gwen Stacy character of Spider-Man and make that because it's so new and so fresh that you can do as many changes as you want to it. The uh, old Spider-Man is probably just, you know, something they just don't know how to how to write for. They just don't know how to deal with it. And anytime they have good writing for it, they just these directors or producers, Hollywood, go, they go in and they just ruin it. So if you're gonna ruin it, just go into the Gwen Stacy Spider-Man, which is a lot uh, a newer adaptation of it, and just do that. That's the only thing I think that's gonna <laughs> save the Spider-Man franchise in the movie. Because if they keep doing the male version of Spider-Man, they're just going to keep doing it wrong and make it horrible and just make us all not want to see the Spider-Man anymore. As far as I'm concerned, enough with the Spider-Man. Stick him in the Avengers and, and do a couple movies and then give everything, everything a rest. Pretty soon people will get tired. That's why Deadpool is such a big hit because, you know, it's getting to the point. If especially Batman and Superman sucks, people are really going to get tired of superheroes. You know, they, the Marvel's been very lucky. Uh, DC. Look at, uh, look at Suicide Squad. Not. It's a different take on the hero genre because these guys are anti-heroes. I, don't, I think people are kind of sick of the Disney-type hero. So you got to have two things. You, you can right. have the Disney-type hero, but also give us, like, the New York-type hero, the anti-hero. A person who's a hero because he's sort of doing something, like eliminating bad people, but he's not so clean. You know, he's not so good. You know, sort of like... A kick-ass thing. He's an anti-hero. So give us the anti-hero. Right. Well, there was also mixed reviews on Suicide Squad. That's why Will Smith all of a sudden, hey, he announced, well, I'm going to bring uh, Fresh Prince back and uh, oh. I'm going to uh, go back to music. Nobody cared. Then he oh. announced, hey, I'm going to do Bad Boys 3. Nobody Look, cared. Uh, uh, I have to say this. I'm sorry, but Will Smith is a, got very lucky. He got very lucky. He was a uh, right place at the right time. You know, like there were people were looking to put uh, a black entertainer uh, in the forefront, and they just picked him out, out of random and said, "Oh, this guy's a clean cut kid. We'll put him in there." And that's how he got lucky because the Hollywood machine has so much money. They put it behind you, and they can make almost anybody a star. They've been saying this for years, and it's true. If they have so much money, the machine is so big. It's like. They have the biggest boombox in the industry that they can blow everybody else out of the water. If they want to make you a star, they'll make you a star, even like the WWF. If they want to bury you, they can bury you, and nobody will ever hear from you again. If that's what they want, that's what they can do. But Will Smith got very lucky. They put him in Independence Day. The movie became a hit. All of a sudden, everybody said, oh, it's because Will Smith. Will Smith made Independence Day. No, he, no, he didn't. Go, oh, Bad Boys 2 mm-hmm. was great. Yeah, yeah, it was. It wasn't that good. I mean, it, it only got the hype from Independence Day. Oh, that really made him a big time uh, actor, a big time action hero. No, he's not. I, I never really liked him. He, he just got lucky. They gave him Grammy when he didn't deserve it. You know, they just give him stuff, and then all of a sudden he's on his own, and he he finds out that he's really not that good, and he he can't sustain anything. But let's see, I, w- I worked with them uh, um, on the film I Am Legend. We were there in the Brooklyn Bridge scene, uh, freezing our asses off. I was supposed to be, so, excuse me, everybody. I'm supposed to work there for five days. I lasted one day. It was that cold. The only reason I was there, because I lived right across the street. Um, but, you know, he was out there freezing also, and he was making the audience... Uh, you know, the, the 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 background actors, he was making them laugh. Said, okay, everybody, come on. We got to keep warm. You know, we got to we gotta do this together. And then, of course, somebody said, yeah, of course, you can do this because you're getting paid $10 million for to do the damn film. Well, everybody what? else was getting minimum wage and freezing. But, you, you know, he was he was nice to people you know, outside, you know. I mean, he said, you know, he said he's a nice guy. But, yeah, you know, the that's the, the Hollywood machine. The reason machine. why he's such a nice guy because in that situation was a do-or-die situation. 
they were pretty much after the Wild Wild West, and then he 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 was pretty much dead in the water. It was like, oh, there's no real magic. You know, the emperor has no clothes, and and he saw, oh my God, they they're coming after me like wolves, and and seeing that I'm not really that talented, or I'm not really that good, or or I really don't have anything that people really want to see. So then he he all of a sudden took the I Am Legend concept or a project and said, yeah, I got to make this a box office hit because if I don't do it, this might be the last curtain for me. Well, he's doing it again with Suicide Squad because everybody said he should have done Independence uh, Day number number two. What is it? Independence Day number you know, two? Well, yeah. he wants his own project. He wants to just be in a good movie and, and come off like, oh, I'm the guy who made this movie. You know, as soon as you brought me to the to the party, then the party got good. Before me, the nobody wanted to show up. Well, the well he did that with uh, with the football movie, and well that kind of tanked, and that's what caused that whole thing about the diversity. That whole you know his uh, you know his wife Pinkett Smith was lucky to have a gig on Gotham to to begin to begin with, and she started up the whole controversy, and uh, it, that did not do him well, any good. Well, because they already think that you know these guys are in a party. They you know it's sort of like the people in the in the in the Kai Castle in the party looking down at the peasants, and then all of a sudden one of these people in the in the high castle says oh i didn't get a, a piece of cake oh isn't this terrible look at all all you poor people how how the people how, how your your favorite son doesn't get a piece of the of the cake in a party and the rest of us who are all here don't even get crumbs say well who cares <laughs> What was Michael Shea in Saturday Night Live? It's like, oh, you boy gunning the uh, the Oscar. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, you're dissing a, a party that you weren't invited to. And, you know, it's got a point there, you know. Even, what was it? And what was the name? Aunt Fifi or Aunt Jane oh. or some uh, of the, the, the actress who uh, played Bel-Air. the aunt. And yeah, her Prince. and Will Smith didn't really get along. She wanted money, but Will Smith. <laughs> yeah, she and, and she, and yeah, and she Will dissed. Will Smith uh, TV show. It's not really about Aunt Biz. Whatever the heck her name Bye. was. <laughs> yeah, but she told everybody off. And then, talk, and I mentioned to talk about diversity, right? I said, well, if you want diversity, uh, um, you know, everybody is on cable, you know. Uh, and then uh, and I mentioned um, Orange is the New Black. And then, by coincidence, on the Screen Actors Guild, uh, Orange and the New Black won, won for Best Cast Ensemble. Uh, a bunch of actors, African American, won. And Edward Alba walked away with two awards. I said, okay, how's that for diversity? So, you know, they, they, they kind of they shut everybody up. I mean, the, the whole business is, is kind of crazy right now. We could talk more about that on the next show, uh, plus a, a bunch of other things. So, we need to wrap up. We actually. Uh, made it to about an hour and ten minutes over here, which was kind of surprised because this is the first time we're using this brand new system. Uh, for everybody who managed to, you know, come this far listening to the show after an hour, thank you for listening, thank you for hanging on, and thank you for listening all the way through the show. Um, no, I just uh, words, I can't Mark. wait to go to to the next episode where I can really let these people in Hollywood have it. <laughs> And that will cause our future unemployment. Okay, <laughs> with that note, <laughs> everybody, thanks but for actually, tuning in. Curse our Hollywood. I actually want to yeah. applaud them because people have to realize it. It is a party thrown by Hollywood. They're putting a lot of money into it for you to show up as an invited guest. And you should show good manners when you're allowed, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, a seat at the table. Bye. Right. Well, yeah. on that note, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you've been listening to the Video Line Express with your host Frankie San and Mark, and thank you for tuning in. And um, next, um, the next show we're going to concentrate more about uh, the Oscar, uh, Oscar predictions, and of course some of the best and worst movies uh, of 2015. We're a little bit behind, but so that's what the whole idea about the show is there, just to catch up. Again, th- thanks for tuning in, and uh, again. Uh, don't forget to check us out on Video Line Express, the blog. That's a daily blog. We, we update that every day with articles and opinions. Um, and you can f- just Google or use Yahoo search. Put in Video Land Space Express two words and you'll see our blog. 
uh, website and our YouTube account. Video Line Express is on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube, type in Video Line Express, you will see all the shows that we did on MNN. Uh, live, there's a half hour show uh, that we do in New York City. We're going to go back in May. In the meantime, that's why these shows are here. And you will hear this show uh, posted soon um, this week. Hopefully, I can do that tonight, edit it, and put it up. And um, you're going to see, you know, you can hear these radio shows from now on along when we go back live. Um, well, that's it for folks. Like I said, just go to Yahoo, Google, type in Video Land Express, two words, and you'll see all the different projects we're working on. Everybody. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you on right. the next care. show. Right. Take care. All right. <laughs>